I set the boundaries of the ocean vast, carved out the mountains in the distant past, molded a man from the miry clay, breathed in him life, but he went astray. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I write the music for the whippoorwills. Control the planets with their rocks and rills. But give you freedom to use your own will. I hold the waters in my mighty hand. Spread out the heavens with a single span. Make all creation tremble at my voice. But my own sons come to me by choice. Even the oxen know the master's stall. And sheep will recognize the shepherd's call. I could demand your love, I own you twice, but only willing love is worth the price. I own the cattle on a thousand hills, I write the music for the whippoorwills, control the planets with their rocks and rills, but give you freedom to use your own will. Soon I will appear in the clouds above, gathering those who know and share my love. My children love me and they know my voice. Will you be one who obeys me by choice? I am the cattle on a thousand with their rocks and rills, but give you freedom to use your own will. And if you want me to, I'll make you whole. I'll only do it though if you say so. I'll never force you for I love you so. I give you freedom is it yes or no? Amen. Well, friends, we, we intend to wrap everything up in this last part. And having heard that song, again now for I don't know which time, <clears throat> a good handful of times that I've heard it, it always affects me the same way. It reminds me of the choice that God gives me every moment, every trial that I have, everything that's going on in my life. And I want you to consider that as we try to wrap up this series, The Experience. And consider and ask yourself where you stand in this overall process, in this three-step process. As far as possible, if you'll join me as we seek our Father in prayer. Holy Father, I guess when we look at ourselves, we really don't see a whole lot of worth. But when we consider what you paid for us, wow. Loving Father, forgive me. Forgive me of my sins. As I kneel in your holy presence now, please wash me and cleanse me. And as I am here before your children, my brothers and sisters, I pray, Father, for your Holy Spirit to take full advantage of my mouth and my mind, my heart. And dear Father, may it be your words like fiery arrows that find their mark in our hearts. As we're closing in on the end of all things, Lord Jesus, we need you. We need the power and presence of your Holy Spirit in our experience as a Christian in order to be successful. We plead, Father, for wisdom. And I pray now, dear God, that you would take hold of the reins and close out this message according to your divine will. For I ask it in the precious, 
glorious name of my Savior, Jesus. Amen. 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 When we were finishing out part five last, we were allowing the testimony concerning Peter and his example of what it is to make our way through this three-step testing process. In the break, I was speaking with a sister, and she pointed out something very important. I said it in a different language, but I like the way that she said it. The reason we never make it out of this category is because we're not willing to take up the cross that Christ lays before us. Sister White, talking about that, and, and that, that's very language, she says to take up our cross is to, to do that which is directly contrary to our nature, uh, that, that cuts across our will. And in order to find ourselves standing on that sea of glass, brought into this condition, into this category, we have to cross the gulf of selfishness. We have to allow Jesus to do the transforming work. And the very fact, as I've said in, a, in, in parts prior to this, the very fact that He is dubbed our Savior identifies something that we don't often consider. We cannot save ourselves. That's why He's called our Savior. If we could save ourselves, He would just be Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord for Jesus. But in order to make our way out of this category, it is imperative that we understand the role of the truth for this time and what's expected of us as we progress through each day of experience that God allows for us. I want to now draw your attention to Martin Luther. <clears throat> I've selected Martin Luther because Martin Luther has been referenced by others. I think... Um, well, it doesn't matter what I think. Martin Luther is someone that I think gives us a, a fantastic example of someone who dealt with things in the flesh. And I want to read to you, this is from Great Controversy, page 158-159. This is Martin Luther uh, in his experience before the Diet of Worms. You, you're familiar with this situation where Rome has finally ra wrangled him in and now he's before the Diet of Worms where all the cardinals and the, and the papacy is, is trying to arraign him on different charges and trying to uh, dispose of him if at all possible. Very, very, very important event in the Protestant Reformation because this man was Catholic in his beginnings. He's the one who wrote the 95 Theses and nailed it to the door. And now here he was by his own people being arraigned and questioned and interrogated. He says, Most ser serene emperor, illustrious princes, gracious lords, said Luther, I appear before you this day in conformity with the order given me yesterday, and by God's mercies I conjure your majesty and your august highnessness to listen graciously to the defense of a cause which I am assured is just and true. If through ignorance I should transgress the usages and proprieties of courts, I entreat you to pardon me, for I was not brought up in the palaces of kings, but in the seclusion of a covenant. Then proceeding to the question, he stated that his published works were not all the same character. In some he had treated of faith and good works, and even his enemies declared them not only harmless but profitable. To retract these would be a, to condemn truths which all parties confessed. The second class insisted of writings, sorry, consisted of writings exposing the corruptions and abuses of the papacy. To revoke these works would strengthen the tyranny of Rome and open a wider door to many and great impieties. Now notice this third one. In the third class of his books, he had attacked individuals who had defended existing evils. Concerning these, he freely confessed that he had been more violent than was coming. This is Martin Luther. Who is our example in all things? Jesus. Jesus, not Martin Luther. Okay? Martin Luther is admitting, I didn't do well in that trial. I didn't write in a Christ-like way when I should have. He did not claim to be free from fault, but even these books he could not revoke. For such a course would embolden the enemies of truth, and they would then take occasion to crush God's people with still greater cruelty. 
Yet I am but a mere man, and not God, he continued. I shall therefore defend myself as Christ did. Quote, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. Unquote. By the mercy of God, I conjure you, most serene emperor, and you, most illustrious princes, and all men of every degree, to prove from the writings of the prophets and apostles that I have erred. As soon as I am convinced of this, I will retract every error and be the first to lay hold of my books and throw them into the fire. Now what Martin Luther came to understand through the process of the Diet of, diet at worm, diet of Worms, Diet at Worms, I think. Either way, Martin Luther learned something. I want to read to you as well from Great Controversy. This is page 156, paragraph 3. He says, now remember, I want to point out to you that this three-step process is, is likened to Acts 3.19 where we're to repent, be converted, that our sins be blotted out. Okay? What Martin Luther is going to do in this quote is he is going to repent. You're going to see a man who's fallen on the rock and is broken, who recognizes that he is not the reason for the success of the, the Protestant Reformation, but that he is but a tool in it. He says, Almighty, Almighty and everlasting God, he pleaded, how terrible is this world. Behold, it openeth its mouth to swallow me up, and I have so little trust in thee. If it is only in, my, in the strength of this world that I must put my trust, all is over. My last hour is come. My condemnation has been pronounced. O oh God, do thou help me against all the wisdom of the world. Do this, thou alone, for this is not my work, but thine. I have nothing to do here, nothing to contend for with these great ones of the world. But the cause is thine, and it is a righteous and eternal cause. O oh Lord, help me, faithful and unchangeable God, in no man do I place my trust. All that is of man is uncertain. All that cometh of man fails. You think that there was some self-awareness going on with Martin Luther? You think that he was able to pray this prayer because he was understanding his smallness in light of God's power and ability to make anything good happen? You know, I, I've never been arraigned before the, the congregation that he was, but can you imagine, you know, the, the, the balconies, the, the paintings, the, the marble, the gra all the things that were there to awe man. And as he walks in, and he's just one man among all this education, all of this money, all of this power, can make you feel small. But in order to feel big again, he needed to know who it was that he was resting all things in. All that is of man is uncertain. All that cometh of man fails. Thou hast chosen me for this work. Stand at my side. For the sake of thy well-beloved Jesus Christ, who is my defense, my shield, my strong tower. So here's Martin Luther recognizing that he needed to make the progress. He knew that in order to be successful working for his father, for his Lord, he had to die to self. He had to overcome. And it had to be not him that lived, but Christ in him. Reading along further, here's where he is converted. This is an example that he was truly converted. His prayer revealed that he had fallen on the rock. He recognized that in his own strength he couldn't do it right. That there were books where he was more violent than he should have been. He was not our example in that. But he is our example in some respects here. But Luther, understanding his danger, had spoken to all with Christian dignity and calmness. Let me read that again. But Luther, understanding his danger, what does that mean? He recognized that he couldn't go through this without Jesus. That's what he knew. Had spoken to all, not the majority, not to the ones that spoke to him nicely, but to all with Christian dignity and calmness. His words had been free from pride, passion, and misrepresentation. He had lost sight of himself and the great men surrounding him and felt only that he was in the presence of one infinitely superior to popes, prelates, kings, and emperors. Christ had spoken through Luther's testimony. Who? So the words that Luther spoke were Christ, okay? With a power and grandeur that for the time inspired both friends and foes with awe and wonder. Now, what if Martin Luther had spoken in the same way 
that he had spoken in his letters against and condemning the, the known evils of that day. These men were defending known sin, known practices of sin. Wasn't he justified? He admits and he realizes that he spoke in a way that was not becoming of his Savior. Here, he chooses to allow Christ to speak through him. And as a result, it says that for a time, he inspired both friends and foes with awe and wonder. Now notice this next part, page 161, a little further along. Sister White writing says, The Spirit of God had been present in that council, impressing the hearts of the chiefs of the empire. Several of the princes boldly acknowledged the justice of Luther's cause. Many were convinced of the truth, but with some the impressions received were not lasting. Do you know that in, in the great controversy, and I, I didn't find the location of this, but Sister White is identifying in this account at, at Worms. She's identifying that by the very deportment of, we, of, of uh, Martin Luther, by his very disposition under cruel attacks by those that were cross-examining him, that these princes were convinced just by his deportment that he had the truth. Amen. What does that say about our representation of Jesus today? What does that say about how we convey the things we understand to be truth? I want to have you consider something in 1 Corinthians, friends, chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. <clears throat> what I've been trying to identify all throughout this series the focus is that we need to have the same experience that the Millerites had. And that is, is that we transition from a hearer of the word to a doer of the word. Yeah. From settling in intellectually, but also spiritually. That we not only uh, build the foundation of Matthew 7, but we begin to build our house of character upon it. Yeah. And this is, the, this is the main theme of this message, but in, in holding hands with it, is that we need to understand, it's my desire to help us understand through allowing Jesus in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy to speak, is that the truth alone will never save us. Amen. It is the tool, it is the springboard, it is, the, it is that which is to begin to carve us out of the mountain, if you will, and then bring us into the workshop and begin to be polished and shaped and chiseled and squared. So let's notice here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Verse 2, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, doesn't say most, I understand all mysteries. So what is this verse dealing with so far right now? What is the centerpiece theme? What is the knowledge? Knowledge. It's about knowledge, right? Let's notice where God places, look, notice where God places knowledge. Okay? When we understand where God places knowledge, then we'll have a better understanding of that there is, a, in fact, something superior to just having knowledge. He says, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, well, that's pretty, that's important because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. So to have all faith is to have full understanding of God's word. So that I could remove mountains and have not love, charity. As I've said before, it does not say as it does in Matthew 5, for the one who's no, teaching known error, that he'll be counted least in heaven. It doesn't say that about this, this particular individual. Though you have all knowledge, if you have not love, and that love is a self-sacrificing love that only Christ can give us. If we have not that love, then it doesn't say I'm counted least. It says that I'm counted as nothing. What is it that the God of creation counts me as nothing? So knowledge isn't the key. What is the key? Love. love. Why? What is so important about love? It is God's character. When Jesus says, I want to write my laws upon the fleshy parts of your heart, it's an inside job. You've got to let him in. You have to open the door of the heart. And not only that, when he writes them upon your heart, what is he writing upon your heart? His, love. His character of love. Right? 
my sheep will hear my voice and they will follow me. Jesus' voice is not harsh. His voice is not condemning. Jesus' voice is ever pleading, ever encouraging, ever enticing you, pleading with us to make the next step. There's a, a parable in the Bible we want to look at right now. And it's the parable, let's go to verse 8, if you will, of chapter 13. 8, and let's read all the way down to verse 13 before we come to that parable. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Wait a minute. Prophecies of God's character. Which of the two is going to fail? The Bible says prophecy will fail before God's love will ever fail. That's powerful, isn't it? What matters the most to God? Love. That you have his, a knowledge of His Word only? Or is it that you have His character? And as we've been explaining this, this whole series, is that you have to have the Word as the foundation. You have to have that. You can't dispense of that. But it is to lead us into an experience that unless we have it, unless that oil is in our lamps, we're lost. We're among the foolish virgins. The parable of the king who comes in to inspect the wedding garments. What's happening in this account? The king comes in. What is he looking at? Is he handing them a 50-page essay test? And if you can fill out all the things here that I need to know that you know, then I can save you? Then you can come and join the wedding feast? Is that what he's saying? What Jesus, what he comes in and looks at is your garments. He wants to know what you're wearing. And unfortunately, there's a man there who's not wearing the wedding garment. And what do we understand that garment to be? Christ's righteousness. So here's someone who's clothed in their own righteousness. And when asked why, how did you come about this garment? He spoke not a word. Sister White will tell us he was self-condemned. He knew. What I'm emphasizing in that is that, and we, we're going to read concerning this, is that the inspection that's being done right now is not inspecting your knowledge. God right now is not judging you on your knowledge. He's judging you on how that knowledge is impacting your Christian experience. Because the Word of God, apart from the Spirit of God, will never flourish into the plant that God intends to grow. You can have the Word, but no water, no grow. No seed doesn't do anything. They put them in bags and seal them up and sell them at Walmart all day long. But if they were to get wet, they'd be of no use unless you had them in the soil. Sister White writing about this in Christ Object Lessons, page 310, paragraph 1. Actually, 309, paragraph 3. When the king came in to view the guests, the real character of all was revealed. For every guest at the feast, there had been provided a wedding garment. This garment was a gift from the king. By wearing it, the guests showed their respect for the giver of the feast. Now think about this in the context of whether I'm wearing the garment or not. Am I, am I striving for the righteousness of Christ in my life? Am I really believing that he's able to do that? and honoring Him, or am I wearing my own righteousness and dishonoring Him? But one man was clothed in his common citizen dress. He had refused to make the preparation required by the king. The garment provided for him at great cost he dis disdained to wear. Thus he insulted his Lord. To the king's demand, how camest thou in here, though not having a wedding garment? He could answer nothing. He was self-condemned. Then the king said, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. Now, following up on this, she says this, By the king's examination of the guests at the feast is represented a work of judgment. The guests at the gospel feast are those who profess to serve God, those whose names are written in the book of life. But not all who profess to be Christians are true disciples. Before the final reward is given, it must be decided who are fitted to share the inheritance of the righteous. This decision must be made prior to the second coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven. For when He comes, His reward is with Him 
to give every man according as his work shall be. Before his coming then, the character of every man's work will have been determined, and to every one of Christ's followers the reward will have been apportioned according to his deeds. What I'm emphasizing in this parable and holding this up before you now is, is that the inspection that Christ is doing right now, He's wanting to know, are you wearing my garment? Do you have my robe of righteousness on? Or are you standing in your own righteousness? Remember, Sister White identified the Pharisees' assent to a theoretical understanding of the truth as their pharisaical righteousness. Knowledge has the ability to empower a man. And for many, knowledge is empowerment. And they tend to rest in that power. But Jesus, it's interesting, Jesus wants us to understand is this knowledge is not to empower you to lift yourself up, it's to show you that you need to be humbled. You need to recognize that you don't have the ability to accomplish what I must accomplish in you, and that's a new character. We can't build the house unless the foundation has been laid. You can't enter into an experimental relationship with God's Word unless you have a theoretical understanding of it. The two go together, but when you stop the process here in the first stage of it and never progress to the experience that the Millerites had, being cut out of the mountain, then polished, squared, chiseled, hammered, and then being fit to be placed right into this, that spiritual temple. We dishonor God. She says, it is not enough for us to believe that Jesus is not an imposter and that the religion of the Bible is no cunningly devised fable. It's not enough to just believe those things. We may believe that the name of Jesus is the only name under heaven whereby man may be saved, and yet we may not, through faith, make him our personal Savior. You see the, the entrance of faith. It's as you and I appropriate the Word of God into our own Christian experience, believing that God is able to give me victory in these areas. That's where success comes. That's where we transition from just a head knowledge into an experience that God intends that we all must have. It is not enough to believe the theory of truth, she says. It is not enough to make a profession of faith in Christ and have our names registered on the church roll. Quote, He that keepeth His commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby know we that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. This is the genuine evidence of conversion. What is? What's the genuine evidence of conversion? Are we keeping his commandments? Whatever our profession it amounts to nothing unless Christ is revealed in works of righteousness. What is that? What are works of righteousness? The fruit of the Spirit. Our challenge today is that we see knowledge coming from one place and we say, oh, they must be righteous. And we don't take the time to ask ourselves, are there fruits being manifested? This is what we need to ask ourselves. The man who came to the feast without a wedding garment represents the condition of many in our world today. They profess to be Christians and lay claim to the blessings and privileges of the gospel, yet they feel no need of a transformation of character. Is that your challenge today? Do you not feel the need for transformation of character? Mm -hmm. Because this is the work of the enemy, is to create in us no sense of awareness that we need a transformation of character. They have never felt true repentance for sin. They do not realize their need of Christ or exercise faith in Him. They have not overcome their hereditary or cultivated tendencies to wrongdoing. Yet they think that they are good enough in themselves and they rest upon their own merits instead of trusting in Christ. Heroes of the Word, they come to the banquet, but they have not put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. So they show up, these people do, they show up, at the wedding feast, and their own righteousness. Do you know who they are? They're in Matthew chapter 7. And what are those in Matthew chapter 7 saying? Lord, Lord, hey, remember me? I, I, I gave that message a thousand times, didn't I? I really gave it to them. Uh, oh, oh, this? Um, yeah, it's just what I threw on. 
owe your righteousness. We need the righteousness of Christ. Amen. Nothing else will suffice. Our understanding of the word is only intended to be that which precipitates a, a corresponding fruit in our experience. Matthew chapter 22, actually I think that was what um, we were just on. Matthew chapter 22, but let me make sure. Brothers and sisters, it's easy to tell people what they need to be doing in their Christian experience. It's another thing to live the example of what we should be doing in our Christian experience. And, okay, so we won't read, this is Revelation 22, 12, is dealing with what we just were dealing, the, the parable of the king who came in. So let me, let me transition here. Signs of the Times, June the 2nd, 1898, paragraph 8 says, The Word of God, just as it reads, is the ground of our faith. We read this earlier. I'm bringing it forward now for another reason. That Word is the sure word of prophecy, and it demands implicit faith from all who claim to believe it. It is authoritative, containing in itself the proof of its design, divine origin. The foundation of our faith is the prophetic word. In the Millerite history, their experience was is that they brought forward the prophetic evidence to prove the imminent coming of Christ. And this is what brought such a change among God's people. All right, so that experience is to be our experience. But what was it? Remember in our last part we read the message of Noah startled the Noatian people. It startled them into realizing where they stood with God and that they were not prepared to meet God. So what I'm suggesting to you is, is that the prophetic message that God is giving us today, the role and purpose of it is to awaken us to the near coming of Christ. What do you say? What do you say to that? Is, is it not, when we, when we look at Daniel 11, 40 to 45, is that not prophetic evidence to prove the imminent coming of Christ? Amen. I mean, we're, we're at Daniel 11, 40, verse what? I mean, Daniel 11, verse 41. We're waiting for the Sunday law to occur. That's right on the horizon. Everything about our message is doing the same thing that the Millerite message did, and that was emphasizing the imminent coming of Christ. In the emphasizing of that, it brought about a change in characters. Amen. Okay, but they didn't say, uh, here's a point I want to make. The Lord just brought this back to my mind. In 1843, April the 19th, when they discovered that fully now the year 1843 had passed, there was no other possible dates, April the 19th was understood by the overwhelming majority of Adventists at that time. April 19th was the first day of the first month. This was the shut door, if you will. This was when 43 was over fully. What happened to this chart? Could you walk around with this chart? Jesus is coming in 1843. They stopped walking by sight and now had to walk by faith. Amen. And I'm saying to us today that I believe, as with the same materials, that we have come to the place where we're, not, we're no longer walking by sight. We're walking by faith, Amen. righteousness by faith. Amen. I believe that Jesus is calling and herding His sheep into that narrow path, saying that my sheep will hear my voice and they will follow. And they're not following a message as its Savior, though Jesus is the Word, they're following the example of Christ in dying to self and overcoming sin that was set for us. I, I, remember what we were dealing with earlier in our last presentation of the Lord. The message of Jones and Wagner was the beginning of the latter rain. And if God shows the end from the beginning, then we can understand that the ending of that latter rain is going to be dealing with righteousness by faith. <clears throat> the prophetic word has its place. Amen. No dispensing of God's word. She says here, uh, Acts of the Apostles, page 475. Let's notice this. The knowledge of God as revealed in Christ is the knowledge that all who are saved must have. That's the knowledge we must have. What knowledge? The knowledge of God as revealed in Christ. That's what it is to have the truth as it is in Jesus. As exampled by Christ, this is the truth that we must have. She goes on to say, this is the knowledge that works transformation of character. 
received into the life, it will recreate the soul in the image of Christ. And that, isn't that what Jesus is waiting for? With longing desire to see His image re recreated in His people? This is the knowledge that God invites His children to receive. Beside which... You, you, okay, you'll say, yeah, yeah, okay, that's good. But we got to have this powerful message too. But Jesus makes... A distinction here. I'm sorry, but I don't do it, but He does. And this is what He says. This is the knowledge that God invites His children to receive, beside which all else is vanity and nothingness. Mm -hmm. Now, I am not in any way denying that in our prophetic increase of knowledge for this time, that Jesus is not in it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. But the emphasis needs to be, as was the message of righteousness by faith, the emphasis needs to be pointing the sinner to the uplifted Savior, Jesus Christ, and His power to overcome in their life and present them faultless before that throne with exceeding great joy. That's the message that transforms the character. The prophetic message of the Millerite history drove them to the foot of the cross and caused them to consider, I'm not ready. 50,000 withdrew, we read, from the churches, but only 50 slide through across the finish line, truly surrendered to Christ. What happened? Well, many were holding the truth in unrighteousness. Their characters were not conforming to what their brain knew and understood. Self overruled and said, no, I like the way I live. Leave me alone. Most of us are just not willing to see the true condition of ourselves. And it's my prayer. It's my experience too. It's my prayer that God will help us to understand that the scales will be removed from our eyes and that we could see truly the sinfulness of sin. Because sin is made to be not so bad by ourselves and our brothers and sisters in the church today, it goes on. If Jesus stood among us, what, what would we change in our habits, in our conversation, in our dress, in our diets? What would we change? Amen. We do not see the sinfulness of sin. That's my problem, and I suggest it's probably your problem too. Because Satan is so successful in saying, well, they do that. Come on now, they do that. You, you know them. They're, they're holy people. They're holy. Brothers and sisters, we can't, we can't afford to be deceived. We need not only the Word of God, but we need the character of God. The Word of God is the seed and brothers and sisters, as it grows through the watering of the Holy Spirit, character begins to grow within us. And it is a case, believe it or not, that you can have too much of a good thing. Notice with me Proverbs chapter 19. In Proverbs chapter 19, let's understand something. I don't know if you've considered this before. In Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 8, <clears throat> Let's understand again, and see, one of the things that I'm trying to underscore throughout this series in dealing with the experience of the Millerites, which to be ours, is putting knowledge and the message in its proper place. I think too many have lifted that up above the work of character. Would you agree? <clears throat> Verse 8 says, He that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul. He that keepeth understanding shall find good. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall perish. Delight is not seemly for a fool, much less for a servant to have rule over his princes. I'm wondering why. I, I, either that or it's... Uh, what, I'm sorry. Let me try one thing. It's close, but if you've put enough papers together over time, sometimes verses find their way in through copy and paste. That is it eight nineteen? Okay, actually, uh, chapter nine, verses eight to eight and ten are good as well. I'll tell you what. I'm going to pass. I'm going to pass by that. Go to Psalms one nineteen, one o three. And it's dealing with the value of God's Word, of knowledge. Okay, knowledge is not a bad thing. <clears throat> Psalms 119 and verse 103. Psalms 119, verse 103. Okay. How sweet 
are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than what? Sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. So the word of God is likened unto honey. All right. Now Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 1. Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 1. The Word of God is where we gain knowledge. In Ezekiel 3, verse 1, it says, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll, and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Okay, so... The sweetness of God's Word, there is such a thing as having too much honey. If you go to Proverbs chapter 25, back into Proverbs chapter 25, twenty-five and verse sixteen. Hast thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee lest thou be filled therewith and vomited. Knowledge has its place. Knowledge is what is the tool of the Spirit of God that leads us to make right choices. Through education of God's Word, we learn the will of God and we understand. Isaiah 30, verse 21, you'll hear a voice behind thee saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. The Holy Spirit will apply the Word of God in our experience, giving us direction. But listen, the reason I'm emphasizing this is we cannot make knowledge our God. Knowledge is a part of a process. We have one true and living God. And I'm not denying that the Word of God is Jesus Christ, okay? Not, not forgoing any of that. But what I'm saying is, is that we have a, just like food is essential for our physical growth, isn't it? And yet the Bible tells that there are those that make their stomach their God. And in the same way, I'm saying that the Word of God, sanctify them through thy truth, thy Word is truth, is essential. But we cannot make just the Word our God. I don't know if that Amen. came across as the way I intended, but I pray it did. Now, the last message, Christ Object Lessons, page 415. I don't know if y'all have really considered this in the way I believe that the Lord is intending it. Um, I will draw it out in this fashion. In Romans chapter 2, actually Romans chapter 1 verse 16 and Romans chapter 2 verses 9 and 10, identify for us that whether it be cursings or blessings, God always deals with His people first. Always. And that's what the Bible teaches us. Okay? Adam and Eve are in the garden. Who does God come to? He comes to Adam. Then He comes to Eve. God is looking at Adam as the priest of that family. He goes to him first. He's most responsible. In the world today, who is the most responsible? Well, it depends on who has the most light. Who has the most light? We have the most light. Judgment begins at the house of the Lord. We're the most accountable. But my point is, in, in this next quote, is identifying something. The quote we're going to read, people tend to apply, I'll show you, from the National Sunday Law forward. They say, oh yeah, that's where that quote comes in. But it doesn't. Because it falls first on God's people. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Okay? What's good for the goose is good for the gander. If there's, if there's a message that is to, to transform the, the fallen churches of Babylon and call the 11th hour workers in, you think we don't need it? Notice this quote. You, you know it. Christ Object Lessons, page 415, paragraph 5 says... Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming. Who's waiting for the bridegroom's coming? Protestantism or Adventism? Adventism is, right? 
Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, Behold your God, the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of His character of love. The last message is a revelation, or may I use the word manifestation, of His character of love. Who's going to manifest that character? Who's going to make the transition out of the first category, die to self, and enter into the experience that the Millerites went through that were standing on the sea of glass on the other side of it? The last message, it doesn't just go to those in fallen Babylon. It's to come into Adventism. There are people within Adventism that need to see the character of Christ in His people. Jesus says that's what He's waiting for. You and I, when we approach the Sunday Law crisis, if we have not the oil in our lamps that happens at the midnight cry back here, if we don't have the oil in our lamps, we don't have the character of Christ. We're not prepared to give the loud cry. So clearly, clearly, that last message has to come among us. Amen. Okay? Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Amen. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. The warning message right now is this. You and I need to live the experience of the Millerites, Amen. the Philadelphian experience of brotherly love. Amen. And as we go forward into our churches, and that is our focus, not to, not to, like Peter, just chop their ears off and teach them what they need to know, but to let them see Jesus shine out. That's what is drawing, isn't it? Isn't that what Jesus says? If I be lifted up in you, I will draw all men unto me Amen. through the power and efficacy of the Holy Spirit. The last message is the message of a revelation of His character of love. The children of God are to manifest His glory, which is His character. We're to manifest His character. Brothers and sisters, we serve such an awesome God. He has all the power. How many of you have ever struggled with some hurdle in your Christian experience that you just didn't think you were going to ever get around? How many of you have ever had that? You ever had that hurdle? Did you get around it? And when you did, you said, man, why did I do this a lot, lot sooner? Why did I wait all these years to do this? God has the power today, sitting here right now, and all those within the sound of my voice, He has the power to change who you are. Amen. I don't care what your hindrances are. I don't care what your financial restrictions are. God doesn't care about that. He owns everything, knows everything. He's the greatest know-it-all there is. Amen? Amen? He knows what you need. If you were going to travel the world, you would go get in touch with a, a travel agency, right? And you'd, you'd, you'd find out what's the best hot places and what's the most beautiful scenes. And you'd just cut right to the chase, wouldn't you? Why not do that with your own salvation? Because God has a blueprint of your life in heaven right now. And He knows what you need. He knows what's holding you back. He knows your weakness of character. And you don't have to admit it to Him. But it would help you if you did. We need to understand we can't stay where we are. Amen. If you come back here the next time we meet and something hasn't changed in you, you're not climbing the ladder. You're not making that progress. Everything, more than the breath you breathe, is of vital importance. This is what's in, important. That we manifest His character. And that we accomplish it by believing that He's able to do this in our lives. Amen. The light of the Son of Righteousness is to shine forth in good works, in words of truth, and in deeds of holiness. You've been around those people in your church that really love Jesus. You've seen them. They love Jesus. And they're not faking it. They're quiet. They're low-key people. But boy, do they speak volumes, don't they? Your ears hurt. They speak so loud. I need to be like them. But consciences, ah, they're not popular. Nobody even knows who they are. That's, that's not what I want to be. Oh, brothers and sisters, we need the meekness of Christ in our lives. Amen. We need the gentleness, the peace, the loving, drawing kindness of our Lord and Savior. That's the only thing that He's going to recognize. 
That's why he says, I know you not. I don't know you. You don't look anything like me. We need to be like Jesus. It is Satan's settled purpose to cut off all communications between God and his people. Now I'm going to read you this quote. This is taken from Lift, um, Lift Him Up, page 361, paragraph 2. This quote I'm reading because I don't want you to think that I believe that we just cast our message off to the side now and live in some other fashion. I know that the truth that God has given me, that, I, that has led me, has been a, a light unto my path for the last 10 years, is not to be discarded. It's an integral part of my relationship. In fact, any truth is forever truth, Sister White says. So we never need to dispense of it. But what we need to understand is its role in our Christian experience. It's that catalyst that gets us moving. It's to bring conviction of sin that leads to righteousness, prepares us for the judgment. It is Satan's settled purpose to cut off all communications between God and his people, that he may practice his deceptive wiles with no voice to warn them of their danger. If he can lead men to distrust the messenger or to attach no sacredness to the message, he knows that they will feel under no obligation to heed the word of God to them. And when light is set aside as darkness, and I am not doing that, Satan has things his own way. I don't want you to think for one minute that the precious truths, Daniel 11, 40, 45, 9, 11, 25, 20, Luke 21, all of the precious truths that we have that for the last 10 years I've had the joy of digesting are false. We just need to identify their role in our Christian experience. They are what is to bring the conviction of sin that leads to righteousness and prepares us for the judgment. Never do we dispense of God's Word. I'm not implying that. I'm trying to draw the focus off of the message onto the work that you and I are commissioned to do. That's the work of character transformation. Through surrender of our will to His will and by faith believing in the work that He says that He can do. In righteousness by faith. The work of preparation. Now some of these quotes I'm intentionally reading to you because we've read them before, but I want you to consider them in the context of the things that I'm sharing, okay? Great Controversy 594 paragraph 1 says, So in the prophecies the future is open before us as plainly as it was open to the disciples by the words of Christ. The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation are clearly revealed. What is it now? What's been clearly revealed? Let's read it again. The events connected with the close of probation. Daniel 11, 40 to 45. The events connected with the close of probation. Close of probation, Daniel 12, 1, Michael stands up. The events connected with it are right there in Daniel 11, 40 to 45. The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation. What does that mean? You need to get your vineyards growing. You need to get your apple orchards planted. So when the time comes, you need to flee to the mountains. You'll have the food. Is that the kind of preparation that we're talking about? Heavens, no. What we need is a time of preparation of character. She says, are clearly presented, but multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. Satan watches to catch away every impression that would make them wise. Make them wise. Virgins, I might add. Make them wise unto salvation, and the time of trouble will find them unready. There's the events connected with the close of probation. Daniel 11, 40, 45. They're clearly revealed. But you know what else is clearly revealed? That you and I have a work to do, and that's to prepare ourselves to meet with Jesus. We need the wedding garment. We need that oil in our vessel. Here in early writing 71, paragraph 2, she says, I saw that many were neglecting the preparation so needful and were looking to the time of refreshing in the latter rain. Now, when we read this, we say, <laughs> I've read that one. I know that's not me. I don't do that. Brothers and sisters, I dare say that there are more than we would be willing to realize that are looking to the future still, not now, not dealing with right now and who you are right now, but looking to the future to take up the work of character perfection. I'll do that next week. I, I, I have some things I need to get away right now, but I'll have some time to clear up and I'll, I'll really address this. Or I'm going on this vacation, so I'll really spend the time with the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we're running out of time. Those last few grains in the hourglass of time are falling, never to be recovered again. Now is the time. This is the time that we need to make our calling and election sure by establishing 
building our house upon that foundation, which is only Christ Jesus, the Rock of Ages. We need to now be building our house. We need to now have an experimental knowledge of Jesus. We need to be a doer of the Word. We need to be spiritually settling in to the truth of God. We need to establish the righteousness, give Him glory, be converted. All of these are the languages of the Bible, not mine. It's a pattern established in God's Word all throughout this three-step process. The first step, I'm going to send you knowledge, Wesley, and it's going to bring conviction that you're not ready to meet me. And the next step, if you're willing to take up the work, is to die to self, and then I can begin to build your house with you. I can then lead you into all righteousness. I can prepare you for the judgment that's coming. I saw that many were neglecting the preparation so needful and were looking to the time of refreshing and the latter rain to fit them to stand in the day of the Lord and to live in His sight. Oh, how many I saw in the time of trouble without a shelter. Let it not be you and I. They had neglected the needful preparation. Therefore, they could not receive the refreshing that all must have to fit them to live in the sight of a holy God. Those who refused to be, now she's going to go back to the language of the, of the account of the living stones cut out of the mountain and squared and chiseled. Okay, She's going to borrow from that language. She says, those who refused to be hewed by the prophets and failed to purify their souls in obeying the whole truth. Amen. I think it's in Matthew. It says, to him that knoweth to do it right and doeth it not. To him it is a sin. If you know that something is wrong and you do it, you, you don't have to wait around for some literal law in God's word that says that. You know it's not right. Brothers and sisters, we need to depart from sin. All sin. And may God reveal what's sin in our lives. Who are willing to believe that their condition... I'll start over. Those who refuse to be hewed by the prophets and fail to purify their souls in obeying the whole truth, and who are willing to believe that their condition is far better than it really is, will come up to the time of the falling of the plagues and then see that they needed to be hewed and squared for the building. But there will be no time then to do it and no mediator to plead their cause before the Father. Before this time, the awfully solemn declaration has gone forth, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. I saw that none could share, it doesn't say share in, none could share the refreshing. The refreshing is the latter rain messages. None could share the refreshing unless they obtained the victory over every besetment, over pride, over selfishness, love of the world, and over every wrong word and action. Sums it up pretty tight, doesn't it? You know, in sports, when I was young and not, not in the church, the coach would say, if you aim low, you hit low. If you aim high, you'll hit higher. Where are you aiming today? Are you really... And another one to pair with this is, never underestimate the enemy. You always anticipate worse than what it's going to be, and you're better off than to underestimate the enemy. Right now, I would suggest to you that I do not understand the seriousness of the breaths that God is giving me right now to make choices, to change the things that I do. I had a neighbor, and God is good to give us these examples, but I have a neighbor that I've never met except that she penned a, scribbled a letter and pinned it to our mailbox while my wife and I were out walking one day. And I'd heard things about this woman. I never met her. And our dogs walked with us. And our dogs can be a challenge for some people. I admit that. It, it isn't what I like. We've done a lot to try to alleviate that. But this person wrote a letter. I mean, just a rebuking and in some ways foul letter. The next day we're walking down the road and she comes out on a porch and begins to holler at us. Are you going to put your dogs up today? And I'm going to tell you, I didn't handle it. I didn't handle it in Jesus. The flesh rose, and I did not handle it according to the way Jesus wanted me to. And what that tells me is, is that, you know what? You're sharing these messages. That's great. That doesn't mean you're coming to my kingdom. You need to reflect me in that situation. You need to overcome, Wesley. This is a simple thing. You don't even know this person. What's going to happen when those you know, that you know and love really start attacking you? Before this time, the awfully solemn declaration has gone forth. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. I read that. We should therefore be drawing nearer and nearer to the Lord to be earnestly seeking that preparation necessary to enable us 
to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Let all remember that God is holy and that none but holy beings can ever dwell in His presence. You know, Testimonies to Ministers, page 31, verse 1, you know this quote as well. She says, In reviewing our past history, <laughs> in reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say, praise God, she says. As I see what God has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and His teaching in our past history. If we forget their experience, then we're, we're in a, a major deficit because their experience is to be our experience. That's what Sister White tells us. The experience of the Adventist people is to be repeated again in our day to the very letter. Their experience was they were confronted with prophetic evidence to prove to them, to convict them of the imminent coming of Christ, and they were then, from that experience, to, to realize that they needed to overcome sin and set about the work of overcoming sin. Don't spend your time just marveling over and churning up the message and understanding every little detail of it and understanding every component of it and how it all went together an nth degree while you're neglecting to live up to the light that you have and moving forward. Meanwhile, maybe doing the same thing. So 1840-44, quote, I, tr I truly love. The Advent movement of 1840-44, to 44, she says, was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. Okay? Glorious manifestation of the power of God. Romans 1.16 For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile, to the Greek. The, manif the glorious manifestation, the glory is the character of God revealed. The glory. Okay, when, Jesus, when, when Moses was hid in the, in the cleft, he says, I'm going to pass before you and show you my glory. The character of God is revealed. The glorious manifestation. We know this word. He's looking for a manifestation of Himself in His people. The glorious manifestation of the power of God occurred in, these, in this history. And do you know what dates they correspond with in the parallel history that they're there to repeat? Nine eleven. till Michael stands up. This is based on other studies we've already produced, but I can defend that. From 9-11 to the close of probation, 9-11 corresponds with August 11th, 1840. We're in a history now, and we're how many years down the road now? Twelve years down the road from entering into this glorious manifestation. God is long-suffering, friends, but He's not forever suffering. We need to recognize that we are in a process we have a window of time where God is wanting to manifest His character in His people before Michael stands up and it's all over. Okay? Now, I want to, in closing, we're going to close here with this. I, wanna, I want you to consider a theme of thought in closing. The Word of God or the character, which is love. The love of God. The Word of God or the love of God? What really matters to Jesus the most? And, and don't you think for a minute that I'm setting aside the Word of God. But as I said before, when the inspection is done, when Jesus comes in the clouds, you don't hear a trumpet blast and everybody puts on the brakes and everybody's suspended in midair while papers are handed out. Well, you, you need to fill in all these questions. And if you get the right answers, then I can take you to heaven. I'm not being facetious or, or sarcastic or, or simple about this, but I need to identify that Jesus is looking for something, and He's looking for Himself reproduced in you. Amen. And that's what the Word, the seed, is supposed to do. In fact, Sister White talks about the heavenly plant of love that we must have.
All right, let's go to Song of Solomon. I'm going to let Solomon close us out here. And I want to allow him to identify the value that God places on these things. Song of Solomon, chapter 1. Um, chapter 1. That's squeezed in there right after Ecclesiastes and right before Isaiah. Right before Isaiah. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Are we all there? We're going to bring this to a close. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me. Now him is Jesus. Me is God's people. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For thy love is better than wine. What is wine? Wine is doctrine, brothers and sisters. What's, what's more valuable than the wine or the doctrine? Thy love. The love is more valuable. Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. What is his name? <clears throat> his name is his character. So his character is what? Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy character is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. I may have, I may have transposed this. My point is, is that God's character like an ointment is poured forth. It's of more value. His character. All right. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. What matters to, G to, the, to God's people is the kisses of their Lord, the tender mercies of their God. What does the Bible say? Know you not that it is the goodness of God that leadeth thee to repentance? It isn't just the doctrine, brothers and sisters, is my point. The doctrine is the stepping stone. The character of God is what transforms you and I. Yeah. Understanding it and attempting to live it is what transforms you and I. <clears throat> We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. Okay? Now, come to chapter 4, and let's look at it in reverse. Jesus is going to speak now. Chapter 4, verse 7. Chapter 4, verse 7. Jesus is the one speaking here. And he gives testimony back. He speaks to, the, to his love, to his wife. Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in the... When is no spot in God's church? At the Sunday law. Okay? Sunday law crisis. The sins are blotted out. God's people, their sins are blotted out. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse. With me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Shinar and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse. How much better is thy love than wine. Not only does, do, do God's people give voice to the fact that your love is of more value to me than your doctrine, more than your wine, but Jesus turns and says the same thing. Your wine is not as valuable to me as your love. Love begets love. Jesus' love awakens love in us. It's His self-sacrificing love, love that took Him to the cross, love that caused Him to give everything that He had and demands the very same of you and I. We shall not enter into heaven unless we enter in by the way, and the way is Jesus Christ, John 14, 6. He's the only way, and it's His way or no way and smell of thine ointments than all spices. 1 Corinthians 13, 2, we've read. This is where Jesus is identifying that though whatever knowledge you have, it doesn't mean anything unless you have love. So there again, the knowledge, the wine, the doctrine is secondary, is placed in a secondary position to the final product that he's trying to reproduce, and that's himself in you and I. Psalms 51, as we close. Psalms 51, 
Brothers and sisters, there is a mighty work that we have to do. Amen. There's a mighty work that we have to do. And if we underestimate it, we will fall far short of the mark. We need the power and strength of Christ in our Christian experience. We've been, we've watched so many seminars, so many DVDs, we've, we've listened to so many speakers, so many different evangelistic series until we have become numb to the reality that we need to take up the work ourselves. We've leaned on the arm of flesh for so long. We've, we've liked pastors and elders and ministerial leaders and, and laity leaders or whoever they may be, even our spouses. We've leaned on these for too long. Jesus says, come and enter in with me Amen. and I with you and I will show you the glories of my kingdom. I will reproduce my image in you. Amen. Amen. I can do that, Amen. Wesley. Do you believe me? Amen. And I say, yes, Lord, I do. Brothers and sisters, we need... We need to enter in. We need to, we need to die to self and allow the second phase of our work now. The walking by faith now. No longer walking by sight. But walking by faith. Faith in. We're transitioning now from a knowledge. No longer walking by sight. We see. We see the powerful truths and how they interlock and how they teach and sustain. But we need to stop walking by sight and now walk by faith. Righteousness is the goal by faith. This is what we must have. Psalms chapter 51 and verse 7. Chapter 51 and verse 7. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. Isaiah, I know I, this was unexpected. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. Brothers and sisters, that light is the glory of God. We are in, the, we are in that curve now of, of the glorious manifestation of the power of God. We're, we're, we're fast approaching the Sunday Law crisis where we are to arise and shine for our light has come. But, but brothers and sisters, we need, we need the character of Christ. It says of these people, Arise and shine for thy light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. The glory, the character of God is risen upon thee. We must have that character. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and His character, His glory, shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light. Thy light. Now let's go back to where we began. In the parable of the five wise and the five foolish virgins. The oil that's missing in the foolish virgin's lamp, we have identified as the Holy Spirit as Christ's righteousness or His character. We've identified it as faith. And we've also identified it as love. But brothers and sisters, that oil, whatever we deem it to be, if it's not in the lamp, the lamp will never give light. You will never be a light unto this world. In fact, right now there are many that are not a light unto this world. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light that's that's coming about because of Christ's character in you. Remember Moses came down off the mount and he glowed because he was reflecting the character of Christ. And kings to the rightness of thy rising, lift up thine eyes round about and see all they gather themselves together. They come to thee, thy son shall come from afar and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. In this series now, wanting to summarize the parable of the five wise and the five foolish virgins. 
rightly understood, identifies that we are standing at the very door of the midnight cry. Joel is emphasizing this. He's using that very language. In, under, in this particular series, what I'm trying to accomplish is to emphasize that the message that God has sent us is distracting a lot of people from the work that they need to be doing in building the character of God. Brothers and sisters, we need Jesus. And yes, He is the Word, but we need the Spirit of God to take that Word and impress it upon our hearts that we might fall upon that rock and be broken. May the Lord bless each one of us as we consider this material to realize and recognize that we are incapable of overcoming apart from Jesus Christ. We need to transition from the knowledge into an experimental relationship with Jesus Christ. What do you say? Shall we take up that work? Yes. Will you join me as we close in prayer? <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for your tender mercies. Father, I pray the seed that you've planted today in my heart and the hearts of those who've heard. Father, it, that you will send your Holy Spirit and water it. Please, Lord Jesus, bless us. Let our eyes be opened. May we, our understanding be made clear. Father, we're late in this game, and we thank you for the sacrifice paid for us. Let it not be in vain. Help us, Lord Jesus, to take up that work of character transformation. We ask these things, Holy Father, in Jesus' precious and eternal name. Amen.